we are witnesses to and custodians of what? Great. You're starting to memorize it. And beneficiaries of the what? That's right. In whose, whose history? Cosmic history. That sounds sort of Star trek doesn't it? But what that means is the entire cosmos, and that includes us this morning. Sirs, we want to know Jesus. So there is a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. That's what we've been talking about all summer, and we'll continue to do this until Advent, where we'll talk about Jesus some more. So in week one, we talked about how just from Jesus' very lineage, we learn a lot about him, that race, gender, or the past don't matter to him. When it comes to salvation, he covers it all. We learned that wisdom, maturity, and grace are the keys to spiritual formation in the next few weeks. By week five, we were talking about Jesus' strategy. And then I always stop at this one. So you may have memorized this one, right? We learned seven things that we need to lose most to gain one thing. The truth that what? Jesus is always always with us. I saw somebody just go, Jesus is always with us. (laughs) That's good. In week seven, we talked about Jesus as the bread of life. And week eight, we talked about living water so that you didn't have to be empty anymore. In week nine, we talked about Jesus as the light of the world. And then in week 10, we discovered 12 character traits. Can you believe you sat through a sermon with 12 points (laughs) of people who really get to know Jesus and experience radical change now and forever? What do they say about 12 point sermons in uh, seminary, Travis? Never preach them, right? Never. Week 11, we talked about giving over ourselves, not giving up, giving over ourselves, being the only way to really know Jesus. And then in weeks 12 and 13, we talked about two miracles of Jesus. One basically taught us, recognize what's in front of you and deal with that situation in the power of the Holy Spirit. And week two taught us, with the same symptoms, by the way, look for something that may be behind, behind a need that's presented that maybe needs addressing. But more than anything, know that God will use us all in that ministry of healing. In week 14, we talked about how When we believe that Jesus cares for us consistently, predictably, and reliably, we can trust in him, attach ourselves to him, and be relationally healthy through him. That's what it means to know Jesus. And now we're on week 15. Can you believe it? And here's the question. What powerful metaphor does Jesus use of us that identifies with what it really means to be on mission with and know Jesus. Do you know what the metaphor is? Salt. Salt. So I'm going to ask you by the end of today, well, well, actually the end of the sermon, how about that? Be salty knowers of Jesus, all of you. Be salty knowers of Jesus. So what does that actually mean, be salty? probably one of the shortest scripture references for a point I've ever made in my whole life, other than Jesus wept. And here it is. Salt is good. Now, you already know that, right? Here it is. Here's a whole bowl of salt. (laughs) Somebody's going, no, my doctor said no. That's white death. That goes along with sugar. No. No, it you do need salt. If, if you don't have the right kinds of salt, your brain will swell up and you'll die. Okay, so you, you need it. So what does salt do? Well, first of all, it prevents the growth of bacteria and other nasty things that could make us really, really sick. Uh, salt also preserves those things into which it is pressed in. It also protects us from getting sick and even further we know that it has to be pressed in to really work so at least when i'm doing barbecue 
I, I noticed that when Rose salts the meat, she doesn't just salt it on the top and watch it bounce all over the place. She puts her hands on it and presses it in and then flips it and presses it in. Then it's, then it's going to make a difference. Salt also is pleasurable. I don't know about you, but I just love it when a little bit of salt gets on something. It, it brings out the flavor. Not so much salt that it burns the inside of your mouth, just enough. Often, it's a partner with something else. I, I'll never forget the first time I watched my father-in-law and mother-in-law make suprasata. You know what that is? It's a, just a really, really, really good, salty meat, kind of like uh, salami. But they not only used salt, but they used oil together. So sometimes salt partners with it. And I was going to bring some prosciutto this morning and actually eat it in front of you. But I, I decided not to because it would make you too hungry and you wouldn't listen to the rest. And when it comes to proportion, you know what it's like to get too much salt on something, right? You put it in your mouth and it's like, whoa, too much. All of that makes salt precious. In fact, at different times in history, salt was as valuable or more valuable than gold itself. Rarer. So what does this mean? Salt is good. Well, salt is still precious. Ancient salt was often as valuable as gold. Even modern nations have been transformed by the power of salt. Do you know what nation that might be? India. Gandhi started his revolution in India by taking over the salt production. If good is an extension of God, then what does salt is good really mean? It's almost an equivalency, isn't it? That God himself is salt. So if God himself is salt and we are his disciples, we ought to be pretty salty. As, as far as I know, God himself is pretty salty. So the lesson that we learn not only is that salt is good, don't lose your saltiness. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? So here's the question in another form. Can salt lose its saltiness and can lost saltiness be regained? Well, the answer is yes. Only when salt becomes impure does it lose its saltiness. Think about that. Only when salt becomes impure does it lose its saltiness. It's always salty until something else gets mixed into it. Have you ever spilled some salt on a table and then trying to save the salt kind of scooped it up like this, put it in your hand and try to put it back in the salt shaker and then you realize, oh, there are other things on that table that I don't really want in my salt. Now it's become somewhat impure. Now its saltiness is somewhat compromised. And what do you do? You walk over to the trash can and do this. Or you go over to the sink and you do this because it's impure. Only refinement can remove impurities and help salt regain its saltiness. So in my illustration, you would actually stand there with your hand and you try to pick out all the things that didn't look like salt and then you'd realize there's stuff in here I can barely see. How am I gonna pick it all out? And even worse, what is it? So then you walk over to the sink and you brush it into the sink. So can, have you ever thought about what if Jesus wasn't salty? Well, think about the implications for his teaching. It wouldn't prevent the growth of sin. Or think about the miracles he did. They wouldn't protect the health of the sick. Salvation wouldn't preserve believing souls. No transformation to press us into his image. Remember, don't let the world shape you into its mold. But let God do that through Jesus. The proportion of sin would drastically increase. What else would happen? Abounding sin would decrease the possibility of true pleasure. It would always be warped. And 
What if Jesus wasn't salty? There'd be no partners in saltiness, no disciples. And the incredible preciousness of Jesus and those who truly know Jesus would be lost to the cosmos. You ever really stop and thought about the implications of what if Jesus wasn't salty? The world would not be changed. We would be living. Think of the culture that challenges you the most in terms of its injustice, its sinfulness, etc. That's the way we'd be living. We've been transformed. So the question, can we lose our saltiness? Yes. Absolutely. That's when the impurities get in the way of our recognizing the work of God through others, and that's what happened in the gospel passage. What else? I changed that slide too quick. We, we would scandalize the little ones, the new believers, and it would cause us to be dismembered. You're losing, did you notice in that passage, you're losing all kinds of body parts? It, it felt a little like, and I don't mean to make light of the passage, but it felt a little like that Monty Python movie where the guy has parts of his body cut off and he says, oh, don't worry, it's only a flesh wound. And he's got very little left. We all laugh at that, but it's, it's gross. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you don't remain salty, you're, you've been compromised. You're being dismembered. And he says it's, it's better to be salty and in the world disfigured and dismembered. And what else? And we're judged. That's what that passage that we read had in it. Jesus was saying, if you're not salty, this is what the world looks like. And my guess is, if we were all honest with ourselves, we would say, because of the lack of saltiness of us as believers, the world is what it is today. But there's hope. Why? Because you can regain your saltiness. <clears throat> Think of those other passages this morning. It, they talk about saltiness too. <laughs> Moses, did you know that Moses called people rabble and craving? Did you notice those terminologies? Moses calls some rabble and craving and loses his own salt in a leadership meltdown. He says, if, you, if I knew you were going to give me this job, I would have packed it in. And God says, wait a minute. Get 70 people and let them help you. And then God, by the Holy Spirit, took some of that spirit off of Moses and put it in the 70 elders so that salt could be multiplied in the community. What about the passage in Psalm 19? The salt of law, precepts, commandment, and the fear of the Lord keeps David free of impurities. Without it, he's dead. Think about if you didn't have the guidance of the scriptures, where you'd be. And this. In the James passage, lost saltiness causes the devilish, double-minded, wretched, proud judgmentalism in James's Jerusalem church. And this is only a few years after having Jesus alive on earth. So we can quickly lose our salt if we let impurities come in. So how do you regain that saltiness? Have salt in yourselves, Jesus said, and be at peace with one another. Here's the meaning. Salt has to be pressed in to be effective. It has to get inside you. Like one of the commercials for one of those power drinks, is it in you? And by the way, that power drink has certain kinds of salt in it that you need to replace if you've been exercising in, in difficult ways. Jesus said, have salt in yourselves. Salt brings peace. And that's not just the absence of conflict, which you could talk about as an impurity, but the presence of all things good, which is God alone. In other words, when the salt of God is in our lives, he's there. And that blessing, that salt 
affects us all. It affects us personally, and it affects all the relationships in the church. So can our lost saltiness be regained? Yes. When our impurities are refined in the salt of knowing Jesus, we're cleansed. God's peace is present, and all are blessed through that. But it would not be a good thing for us to continue without considering this question, because it's really insightful. How do we become impure? Sometimes it's our habits. So we always have to ask ourselves, to what am I habituated? And you can find out to what you're habituated by taking stock of your day. Where did you spend your time? The big blocks of time are the things to which you're habituated. And the little blocks of time are things to which you are not habituated. Early on in my ministry, I had a friend who was a lawyer say, so how do you keep track of what you do? And I said, well, I keep a calendar. Do you keep it like I have to keep it? I, if I work on something for 15 minutes, I have to write down 15 minutes for this client and 15 minutes for the next client and 15 minutes for the next client. That's the only way I can build them legitimately. And I said, you know, I, I don't think I do it in quite that detail. And he looked at me like, well, you should. And I thought, if I took all that time detailing those things, I wouldn't have time to do some of the other things that I'm doing. And yet, on the other hand, I thought, that would be a really good strategy to tell me, what are you habituated to? Sometimes it's histories. Every one of us has pasts. Every one of us has things that play from the past. When we were still using recording tape, you remember when people would say, you're playing the old tapes. Now, sometimes you know that playing the old tapes is a really pleasurable experience, right? Like when that song on the radio comes on that reminds you of a very pleasurable experience and suddenly you're stuck dead in your tracks, you don't know how the chemicals work to do that. But it's like, oh, I'm right back there. I'm experiencing the smells. I know what I was seeing. I know how I was feeling. Oh, those are good histories. And then sometimes someone will say a word, a single word to you, and it'll take you back to the most horrible experience you've ever had. Something that you haven't gotten rid of, something that's still on your agenda to solve, something that still causes you anxiety, something that is so profound that maybe you, you're even apathetic. You, you think, I can, I can never undo this. And if it's with a person and that person's passed away, now you really can't undo it. How do you live with that? Do you just curl up in a fetal ball and die? No. No, that's, that's when you need God's help to teach you what to do in a circumstance like that. Sometimes we become impure through the harangues in our life. The ongoing fights, the ongoing anger in our lives. And folks, if you've never been angry before, my guess is in the last few years, you've experienced anger in ways that you've never experienced it before. It just feels like the whole culture is bent on being offended or offending. We hear about cancel culture and critical race theory and all kinds of things that are meant to just cause us to explode on the inside. And yet, you know, you can't explode on the inside <clears throat> and especially let it out 
on your Facebook page because you'll get all kinds of trolls suddenly. What a way to live. Feels like life is a continuing harangue, and that can cause hurts. Deep wounds. Dismembering wounds. Wounds that do make you want to curl up and die. Wounds that make you want to withdraw from culture and just leave it alone. And some of us are experiencing that in our very families. We can't even have conversations. You know, years ago, we always talked about crazy Uncle Eddie who comes to Thanksgiving, but he packed up and went home. Now it feels like everybody's Uncle Eddie. Or you don't know who Uncle Eddie really is. And sometimes it's hang-ups, things we can't get past that contribute to the impurity in our lives. We just don't see the saltiness that Jesus has given us. And we don't let the power of his Holy Spirit change us. Well, if you ask one side of the question, how do we become impure? How are we refined? This is what I found, guidance of scripture. When I was six years old, I went to a vacation Bible school at a little Baptist church in Franklin, Massachusetts, and they taught me to make a cross out of burnt matchsticks. And they taught me one verse of scripture. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We were still using King James. Your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your salt has been pressed into my heart that I might not be impure. How's that for an interpretation of that scripture for this morning? I found all kinds of wonderful truth in scripture. But we heard from James this morning. Do you know that James writes this little passage that says, you should be slow to speak and quick to listen. What does that mean when you're 20? Nothing. Because you're sure that you know what all the answers are. So you're quick to speak and slow to listen. In fact, when a person's talking to you, you stop listening to their words because you're already formulating an answer for the question that they're not asking. And none of us as mature adults does that, right? That's not something we carry over from our 20s into our 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and some of you 90s. No, we don't do that because we've been involved in spiritual formation. We've gotten wisdom, maturity, and grace. Eh, not so much. The guidance of Scripture. You know what I found happened when I started listening more? people started listening more to me. I'm not kidding. I sat in a group of 80 people as we were putting together a religious channel. And I didn't say a word. I was my denomination's representative and I didn't say a word until at the very end, the moderator of the session said, we haven't heard from that guy. You know, the benefit of listening is you can jot down notes and I just looked at my notes and I said, you know, here's what I'm thinking. And I listed off a few things and he said, I'd like to put you on the steering committee. And there were people who had more degrees after their name than my wife had letters in her Italian last name. <laughs> Sometimes you get opportunities to be a part of the transformation of the culture around you, if you're willing to take just that little bit of advice and apply it 
press it in, in a salty way in your life. The guidance of scripture. Jesus and the saints' examples, saints old and new, old and new testament. You, I felt like Moses felt sometimes in leadership, and I'll bet you have too. God, why did you give me this job? I, I love the people I serve. I've always loved the people I serve, but why did you give me this job? And God says, you're trying to do it all on your own. I've given you the Holy Spirit, but if you'd like me to spread it out a little, let's get 70 more people to help you out. Yeah, that won't work. Think about Jesus in the story that we read this morning. How he talked to his disciples and said, hey, don't stop them from doing the works of God. If they're not against us, they're for us. Let's go forward with all of that harnessed power and change the world. But they're not from our group. But they're in the kingdom. Beloved encouragements. I wrote it that way because I want you to understand beloved encouragements or encouragements from people you love or people who love you. You haven't stopped listening to them, have you? <laughs> I watched this happen. You know, honey, I, and this was not in my own house, by the way. You know, honey, there's, there's something that still bothers me about the way you talk to people. You never let them, what? Not this again. Okay, what? You never let them finish a sentence. Did you hear what happened? Now, you might not find a scripture verse for that. <laughs> you might not find Jesus saying exactly those words or any of the saints. But in that moment, your beloved is an instrument of God for you. So using scriptural guidance and using the example of the saints, and listening to the beloved encouragements of those who care for you can be wonderful in terms of refining who you are if you'll just let God speak. And speaking of God speaking, what about when the Holy Spirit just kind of nudges you? Not the elbow that you get from the person next to you in the pew. What, what about when God says, uh, you feel that little check in your spirit, like, mm, I could have done that better. Or when he whispers in your ear, I'm here today because one day I was driving north on 400 Highway in Toronto, and I said to God, you know, I'm not sure I'm doing very much for you. Why don't I just contact my old baseball coach and maybe... I can get a tryout with a team. And I was going under the bridge at Shepherd Avenue at about 60 miles an hour, and I heard a voice. I'm not used to hearing voices in the car all by myself. And I heard a voice say, is that what you really want to do? It was so real to me, I turned around and looked in the back seat of the car. I thought somebody had snuck in the car and at that moment, had spoken. And as I passed over the bridge and heard those words, is that what you really want to do? Almost involuntarily, I said, no. And guess what? My situation got worse. but I'm here today because of that. It was a confirmation of call that was so deep, so salty. That 
was in 1975. 46 years ago. I'm glad I listened to that nudge. I'm glad I heard that whisper. <laughs> I hope you are too. So that's how we're refined through the scripture, through examples that we find in scripture, through the encouragements of those around us. As the Holy Spirit nudges and whispers us, do you see anything in that little progression? That's exactly how we discern the call of new ministers in our denomination. Those are the things. So refined salt. What impurities keep you and me from being salty and knowing Jesus? Now take, take these home with you this afternoon. Think about them. Pray about them. What keeps you from being salty? What are the impurities? It, is it some hurt, some hang up, some, some harangue, some history? Is, is that what's holding you back? Do you just not spend enough time in God's word or let it sink deep into your life? Like when you read the passage, just read a short passage. Don't read long passages. Just read short passages and say, God, please help me work this out in my life today. And keep reading that passage until God works it out in your life today. He will be faithful. Will you enter the refining process today? Maybe God's spoken to you about something this morning. And you've just been able to put it off. But now God is speaking to you in a new way. I was talking to a guy and his wife. Very recently. And, and they told the story of how God removed a block in their ministry and allowed them to say and do things that they never thought possible. An impurity got removed. Saltiness was powerful. So how will you start? Will you start today? Don't, don't let today go by. You've just heard this amazing word from Scripture from Jesus and a little bit of commentary on it. Are you going to let that get away from you? Are you going to live another day? with some hurt, some harangue, some history? Are you, are you gonna? Some habit? Why, why not get rid of it today? Week 15, that's this week. Honestly, only truly salty believers survive in a world polluted with impurities. It's the only way you're going to make it. Allowing God to refine us through the scripture, spirit, sacramental grace, and salty others makes us salty again. And that's what it means to know Jesus. It's basically throwing your arms open and saying, okay, God, give me all of it you think I can take. And then when you're finished, more. Please. Please. Knowing is practicing. Let salt press in to your life through the word. Don't just let it bounce off your life. <laughs>